So let's look at the sock sequence in a little bit more detail. So again, it's one of these cratonic sequences. A cratonic sequence has a, a larger grouping than a supergroup. It's really, the, it's a large scale lithostratigraphic unit. So it's really based on the rock type. So the, that rock type is time transgressive. So the, in other words, like for example, the, the top each sandstone that we see in Arizona is gonna be older than that same sandstone in terms of lithography that we see up in Wisconsin. So you'll, so I'll, I'll show you a slide of that in a moment. These um, cratonic sequences are also bounded by these craton-wide uh, unconformities. So along the whole craton, we, uh, we see an unconformity or really that erosion event, which really documents the, the regression of that C, that regressive event. And then we also use a concept called sequence str stratigraphy. So remember, stratigraphy is a sequence of strata, the sequence of events. And we study of the rock relationships within a time stratigraphic framework, right? And it allows us to look at facies. So the key facies, at least for, for this class that we want to emphasize, is that sandstone, shale, limestone facies. Whenever you see those rock units in whatever particular order, you can determine whether you have a regression or a transgression, right? So we talked about that in an earlier uh, video. Now, looking back in a little bit more detail at the sock sequence, remember Neoproterozoic to early Ordovician, and it was the first major transgression on Laurentia, on this North American continent. And it's, it's primarily Cambrian rocks that were laid down, right? So that would be the transgressive event uh, where we actually see the physical evidence of rocks. And we see those rocks in the Grand Canyon, so the top beat sandstone, the Bright Angel Shale, the Mauve Limestone. We see them in Death Valley, primarily the limestones there, but that's that Wood Canyon for formation, the, the Carrera formation, the Bonanza King formations, the Brisky Quartzite are in there as well. And then in the East Coast, we also see a sock sequence there, but there the rocks have been heavily metamorphosed from different orogenic events that occurred along the East Coast. But some of the ones we see there are the Manhattan Schist. So Schist is a metamorphic rock. And it was probably some siliciclastic sandstone or shale. We also see um, a, a limestone there as well that documents that sock, sock sequence in, um, in New York area as well, the East Coast. What we know about the sock sequence as well is that it was shallow water deposits. And because in the sandstones and in the limestones even we see ripple marks, which means obviously water oscillating shallow water. We see these oolitic limestones. So, so ooids are these little sand-sized spheres. They're called, uh, they're called ooids. And they're com composed of calcium carbonate. Composed of calcium carbonate. So these little ooids, and when you look at these in cross-section, what you find is that they show a concentric growth. The only way they're growing is that means that they must be rolling around somehow, right? So you must have some sort of tidal or wave action that rolls these ooids into the spheres. The other important thing is these shallow water deposits, they must have been warm and tropical, right? Similar to the Bahama Banks. And the reason is, remember, cold water holds more gas. In that case, the gas we're concerned with is carbon dioxide. So cold water holds more gas. If you have more carbon dioxide, you're gonna combine that with water, and you're gonna make that H2CO3. And remember, that's a carbonic acid. The significance of carbonic acid is, what does acid do to carbonates? It dissolves them. When you put acid on calcium carbonate, it dissolves them. So in other words, colder water inhibits the precipitation of calcium carbonate. So in other words, you, you can't make these in cold water. So that's why we need warm tropical waters because that way you're gonna have low activity of carbon dioxide. You're not gonna make the carbonic acid which allows you to precipitate the oolitic limestones. Let's look at, look, look at these slides, slides 16 and 17 here. So again, looking at this sock sequence, Neoproterozoic, the first transgression, we talked about the Cambrian rocks, the Death Valley rocks, and then the rocks we see in, in New York or at least along the East Coast, which also document that sock sequence. But remember, these have been heavily metamorphosed. So the Manhattan Schist and the Inwood uh, Marble, which used to be a limestone. Now looking at slide 16 here, um, for the Grand Canyon, remember we have this great unconformity, the nonconformity 
below this would be the Vishnu Schist and the Zoroaster granite. Remember, 1.7 billion years old, 1.4 billion years old. But then we see the sandstones, right? And that first sandstone would be that top eat sandstone here. And note that the top eat sandstone farther west is going to be older, in this case, lower Cambrian. But as you go farther to the east, that same sandstone is going to be middle Cambrian. It's younger, right? So that's, that's just emphasizing that time transgressive particularity of that lithostratigraphic unit, right? Time trans it, it spans two different times here. But then we have the, the Bright Angel Shale and then the Mauve Limestone. Again, showing that sea level is rising or we're seeing that transgression, right? And then in the Grand Canyon, we have the, the Wood Canyon Formation and then Zabriskie Quartzite, which is a shallow water uh, sandstone. But then we start seeing the Carrera, Bonanza Keen, Nopa Formation. All these are limestones, right? So we're getting deeper water formations here in the Death Valley region. Looking at this slide, 17 kind of a, is another way of, of, of looking at the shallow water conditions. So here's that exposure of the Canadian Shield. Again, note that most of North America or Laurentia is south of the equator here during this Cambrian time early Cambrian, and then we're seeing that deposition of the, the, the protolith to the Man Manhattan Schist over here in New York. Maybe that, that inwood limestone is forming here that eventually is going to make that marble over here in New York. And then over here in the, in the, in the Grand Canyon Death Valley region, we're seeing the Top Eat Sandstone, Bright Angel Shale. Uh, we're seeing the bon Wood Canyon, Bonanza King formations, all those over here in Death Valley. So we're, we're starting to deposit those initial units and they're all related to that sock sequence. Thinking about the oolitic limestone, uh, so these are, here are the Bahama Banks and you can see the ripples. See the ripples in the in the shallow water carbonates forming in the Bahama Banks. So remember the Bahama Banks are, are just north of Cuba, um, sort of southeast of Florida in that area of the Florida Strait. And then uh, when you look at the limestones you'll see they're composed of these little ooids, right? They're sand sized spheres. So these are about one millimeter in diameter, uh, pretty small. So they roll around and they make these little uh, oolitic sa uh, sandstones or limestones and they directly precipitate from seawater. So in other words, you need that warm water, tropical, that has low activity of, of carbon dioxide. And then the tidal currents of wave action are rolling these things into existence. And here's a view of the Grand Canyon of, Ar of Arizona. So here's that Vishnu schist, that metamorphic rock some Zoroaster granite in here that intrudes it, that kind of pink rock you see in here. And then here's that great nonconformity. And then we have the top eat sandstone. The slopey unit here is a bright angel shale. And then the cliff former here is that mauve limestone, right? So there's our first unit there. And then to emphasize this bit about the Sauk Epiric Sea, right? So these are cross-bedded sandstones in Wisconsin that are upper Cameron, but these are really the same lithostratigraphic unit we see over here in the Grand Canyon, that top eight sandstone, except here they're lower Cambrian, they're early Cambrian. Again, showing that they formed here first and as a, as a sea transgressed over the continent, they formed later on over here in Wisconsin. But um, again, the same lithostratigraphic unit spanning uh, different time periods there. Now I want to look at the Tippecanoe sequence so remember, this is the second major craton-wide transgression. And the key unit here is that St. Peter sandstone. So this would be the basal sandstone that marks the transgression of that Tippecanoe Tipicano Sea, or the sequence. Uh, and it's going to be middle or division to early Devonian. One thing about the St. Peter sandstone, it, it is a clean quartz sandstone, and it's used for manufacturing glass and and it's an important commodity or resource in the Midwest. Also, what we find in this Tippecanoe sequence is a widespread carbonate deposition. So in other words, we're making limestones, and primarily in the form of, of organic reefs. And some of those reefs are going to include corals or these sponge-like organisms called stromatoporoids. Uh, so they're porous, and they, they're related to sponges, but they kind of look like stromatolites. Uh, we have bryozoans, which are um, also called moss animals, so they're little invertebrates. And then the organic reefs, remember when we're looking at organic reefs, where do we see them today? We see them between 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude, so we're going to see them in the tropics. We really don't see them outside the tropics. So when we find fossils of the organic reef, they occur outside the tropics, 
It just means that the tectonics has moved these reefs from their place of origin to their current position. And so these organic reefs are really linear masses of carbonate secreting organisms, primarily corals, stromatoporoids, these um, early organisms called archaeocyathids, which were kind of related to sponges, bryzoans, brachiopods. Uh, you'll, you'll find that most invertebrates, like arthropods or mollusks, they make a shell and they, they secrete calcium carbonate from seawater to make that shell. This Paleozoic uh, is really marked by these carbonates. We need to know a little bit about the structure or the general reef complex. And so your book kind of has a little example of this. I kind of drew a cartoon here. So here we got the land or the continental setting over here. And then you'll find that between the, the reef core and the land, there'll be a, a shallow water lagoon where there's quiet waters and usually there's restricted flow uh, from, from the deep ocean waters into the lagoon. So the waters here become brackish, they become highly saline, and you can get the precipitation of evaporite minerals. And usually the evaporite sequence is very, uh, um, follows a, a characteristic sequence of, of mineral crystallization of these. Uh, when 50% of the seawater has evaporated, uh, we start seeing calcite to be deposited. So calcite is really the, the first precipitate or evaporite to be precipitated in these lagoonal settings. Uh, remember the sun setting of these, lots of evaporation, there's restriction from fresh seawater flows, so they can get quite brackish. We start seeing calcite. And, and usually the calcite will make a, a limestone, a very fine grain, muddy, fine texture. We usually call that micrite, micritic limestone. And then uh, after that, we'll get gypsum to precipitate. And then the last thing to precipitate will be the rock salt or halite. Uh, just a special note here, uh, gypsum is hydrous, so it's calcium sulfate with some amount of water in it, so it's hydrous. And hydrite is another common mineral we find in these evaporites, but anhydrite is also calcium sulfate, so it's just like gypsum, but it has no water. So it's, it's a dry form of gypsum. There'll be a back reef, the reef core. Usually there's a flat area, flat area of the reef over here. And then usually we find a very blocky, angular slope of broken rocks here, uh, usually making breccias. And we call that the talus, right? So talus is all that fractured and eroded rock that makes a, uh, usually it's a talus apron that we see over here. And here would be the deeper ocean waters. We find them in the Michigan Basin, down in the Permian of West Texas, the Guadalupe Mountains. Uh, some of the first organisms to start developing a reef core, right? Because you need you need an anchor point, right? So the first anchors were these archaeocyathids. And these are related to sponge peripherins. So phylum periphera are the sponges. But these um, secreted calcium carbonate and they had a double wall. And so they were the first Cambrian reef builders. Uh, once we get to this Tipicanusi, we find that stromatoporoids were a key reef builder after that. So the St. Peter, a very clean quartz sandstone. And here is a, a Governor Dodge State Park in Wisconsin where you see the, the St. Peter sandstone exposed. And then I mentioned a little bit about these organic reefs. I drew a picture of this. And then here are uh, a sketch of an archaeocyathid. Remember the first Cambrian reef builders there. And the Michigan Basin is famous for these evaporites and organic reefs. So in fact, a, pretty much a whole upper peninsula of, of Michigan here has a, a, a huge organic reef. And so this would be that, that top flat part of the reef. This would be the open ocean farther out here. And in the middle of where you would see the, the evaporites, the calcite, the gypsum and hydrite, the, the halite forming in here. And here's an image of it as well. So note that it was right near the equator when this was forming. So here's our barrier reef system. And then we end up getting these pinnacle reefs, right? So um, in among all the, the halite and, and uh, evaporite that's forming in here. And these are the stromatoporoids. So you can see they're almost like the stromatolites. They're kind of in these layers, but they're kind of related more to sponges and to uh, cyanobacteria. And one interesting thing about these um, pinnacle reefs, you know, there's so much salt here. In order to precipitate salt, you need to have highly saline waters. And so the, the puzzling question is, how can you still have animals living there making these reefs? So there's some unusual effect going on here that geologists are still trying to figure out how we're making 
these stromatopore barrel reefs when the water is so salty that we're precipitating all this this halite here evaporite 